This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus, episode 653. This week, we've got the Z-Man coming in from Florida. He's at the AML Winter Break, a.k.a. the Florida Mold Conference. Looking forward to talking to him and going through his Odor Hunters presentation. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They are the reason we can continue doing the show. And don't forget about afterthoughts.iaqradio.com, sponsored by First On Site, for additional talk after the show. Our marquee sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus, ParticlesPlus.com, TSI Inc., TSI.com, Sunbelt Rentals, SunbeltRentals.com, April Air, April A I R E. Dot com. Healthy Indoors Magazine, HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to report that Neil Zimmerman from Glendale, Wisconsin, was first to identify actor Bill Redden, who portrayed the inbred hilly banjo player who was paid $500 for his performance in the movie Deliverance. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, January 28, 2022, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in the precision instrumentation for monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ radio trivia question. What is the medical definition of growing or thriving best in an intermediate environment, as in a moderate temperature? Back to you, Joe. All right, Cliff, the Z-Man Zlotnick has been hunting odors for going on five decades. He's a pioneer in developing processes for finding the source of odors and for correcting the issue once it's discovered. He's doing a presentation this week at the AML Winter Break, also known as the Florida Mold Conference, and he's going to preview that presentation with us here today. Welcome back, Cliff. Always great to have you. Always great to see your presentations. Yeah, good, Joe. Thank you. Um uh, let's see. I have Before to, we get started, how are things going at the conference there? Everything lined up as expected? Yeah, conference is going well. I mean, uh, yesterday uh, you know, I moderated uh, a session. It was a, a pre-session, and uh, we had a, a legal panel. We had, um, which was done by two local attorneys, based mostly on Florida law. And that was uh, Justin Peterson and David Popper Popper, uh, did that. And then we had uh, Ken Larson. uh, We had John Laboutier. Larson uh, was dealing with um, IEPs, uh, you know, what is an IEP and and, and so on and so forth. John dealt with um, issues regarding inspection, uh, Rusty Amarante. Uh, dealt with, um, you know, just just general issues uh, of, you know, that Belfort faces uh, currently. Don't forget, don't forget Dr. Moon and Peter Croson. That's right. And then I had uh, Ralph Moon and uh, Peter Croson. All right. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump right into your presentation, the okay. odor hunter. All right. Well, uh, we're, well this is an odor hunter uh in training, it's a bloodhound puppy. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think what we want to do is get started and, and talk about what actually an odor is. And an odor is a 
volatilized chemical compound or a gas that humans and animals can pick up uh, in low concentration. So we call it an odor, we call it a smell, we can call it a scent, uh, and we can refer to it as pleasant or unpleasant. Um, the terms pleasant or unpleasant uh, oftentimes uh, are used around the term scent, aroma, and fragrance. Uh, when we use the word odor, a lot of times in the United States, uh, it has a negative connotation. And what's interesting is in Europe, it does not. When you have when you use the word odor in Europe, um, it's it's considered uh, neutral. Hmm. UFOs, uh, you know, my definition of a UFO is an unidentified uh, foreign odor. And UFOs are really not unusual. You know, we go in to, maybe to our home, to our work, to a business, to an elevator. Uh, we tend to, uh, you know, encounter these odors, uh, you know, everywhere and anywhere. And sometimes we can identify them. We know what they are. Sometimes we're not sure what it is. Um, I have another term that I call soul odor, and that's when a solo person, when only one person smells it and other people don't. And when everyone smells it, I kind of call that a universal. Odor. And uh, that's something that, you know, everyone smells and everyone uh, reacts to. Hmm. You know, as individuals, our odor perception is not created equal. Odor detection threshold is the lowest level at which a human can detect an odor. Odor recognition threshold is the lowest level at which we can identify the odor. And, but odor detection level is much lower. You can detect it, you don't know what it is. Odor recognitions can be significantly higher. We know what it is. We can identify it. Uh, perception and odor recognition are two different things, and this varies uh, between individuals. In a building, uh, the materials that are commonly found are not created equal. We can have stone and wood and plaster and drywall and glass and plastic and ceramic tile and flooring. And on the personal property side, you know, we can have artwork, we can have textiles, furniture, bedding, uh, et cetera. So these materials are also not created equal. So a building is not made out of a single material and all the personal property is not made out of uh, a single material. The one big difference among these materials is porosity. The more surface area a material has, the more likely that material is to pick up, retain, and hold odor. During a fire, materials burn, they melt, uh, the smoke contains gases that are fire-related, it contains particles, it contains tars, it contains resins. And during a fire, we have heat, we have smoke, we have particulate, and we have smoke odor. And th these are not deposited uniformly indoors. So in the slide, you can see where, uh, you know, this fire emerged from the outside of the building. That was really the origin of the fire and other uh, parts of the building were significantly less impacted. So we have less odor and less residue in those areas. So residual smoke odor resides within burnt materials. It, res it is carried on gases that are absorbed into materials and that resides on fire-related particulate. And once the gases are absorbed by a material, once a material is burnt or charred, or once a material has fire-related particulate on it, that becomes an odor source, and odors are re-emitted from that source. You know, it's like you may be a non-smoker, or you walk into a bar or a restaurant, and you know, that allows smoking and you come out and you smell like cigarettes because your clothing picks it up, your hair picks it up, and your skin picks it up. So during a fire situation, location, orientation, and distance from the fire are determining factors for odor retention. 
And as you can see in the slide, this is a horizontal surface and uh, you can just see that it's black, but there's very, very little residue that's on the wall uh, behind it. So this was some distance from the fire and this is uh, smoke that uh, had cooled in the air and had settled uh, on, the, on these surfaces. So during an odor event, and it can be any odor event in this situation, uh, you know, we have a skunk. So odors, again, are not going to be deposited uniformly. If that skunk sprays underneath the house or if that skunk sprays an animal that then enters the house, a lot of times a dog will see a skunk in the yard and you know, the two of them are going to tangle and the dog's going to get sprayed, uh, runs into the house and everything the dog rubs up against is going to become uh, an odor source. But odors are generally not uh, deposited uh, uniformly. We're talking about odor diffusion, and that's the net movement of odor from an area of high odor concentration uh, to an area of lower concentration. Uh, air movement also can uh, transport odors as well. Let me let me go back to the you had uh, go back two more slides where you had the sources of odor. There we go. Do location, orientation, and distance. It seems that maybe a, a smoke-related odor and a skunk odor um, have a big difference in that the smoke-related odor may not be as, um, I don't know, sticky. You know, it doesn't have that, that sticky substance in it like a, like a skunk odor does. Have you found that to be the case, that, that a fire-related odor, depending on where, of course, it came from, doesn't stick around as long as a skunk odor? And Why? Well, I would say it's probably the opposite, Joe. Uh, fire, okay. you know, after a fire, a lot of times, if it's not uh, properly corrected and mitigated, the odor can remain uh, for a long period of time. And, you know, uh, let's, you know, I've, I've actually driven over skunks accidentally with my car and, you know, uh, you know, I, I had some odor on my tires and the underside of my car and, you know, it's gone with, you know, generally with it within a couple of days. But you're, you're right that some odors can be very, very, uh, very, very sticky. They linger and stick. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, and I'm wondering when we get to that point, you know, the difference in cleaning up after those two types of, of uh, contaminant, I guess. But let's well, move on. I, well, you know, you know, from an odor standpoint, typically on uh, we would use uh, it depends on the type of fire which processes we're going to use. But generally, if you're dealing with a skunk, uh, we're going to use an oxidizer such as chlorine bleach, chlorine dioxide, uh, something, something like that. Okay, so same thing with microbial odors. We have a, a microbial odor source in a building such as uh, a mold problem or a sewer backup. Uh, again, uh, the odors are not necessarily going to be deposited equally, but they'll be carried on air. And again, uh, this odor diffusion areas of where you have a, a lot of odor are going to migrate towards areas where you don't. Okay, so technical question, Joe, I'm going to ask you, uh, you're a smart guy. What's more important, A, to determine the location of an odor emission, or B, to determine the chemical composition of the emission? I'm going with A, Cliff. Okay, you're right. Uh, once we know the source of the odor, there's always gonna be a remedy. Even if we have to tear the building down, remove the material, clean it, paint it, seal it, coat it, you know, there's generally something we can do. Knowing you know, you can go to a laboratory and they can try to t determine exactly what it is. Uh, they can't always do that. And what happens is oftentimes there's interfer interference. You know, you've used SUMA canisters before, so have I. They do the SUMA test in the house and you get a readout of 100 different materials and so many parts per million and so many parts per billion and so on and so forth. But you don't necessarily know what you're dealing with because you got a bunch of little things. And then the customer gets real excited because they start looking on the internet for all of those different things. And they find out that some of them are hazardous and some of them are more hazardous and, and so on and so forth. So knowing where the source is, is more important. 
So for people that are that are watching, I'm going to give you a couple of takeaways. I'm going to talk about an existing method for odor investigation. I'm going to talk about some improvements to that method of odor investigation. And then I'm going to give you a preview uh, of a method in development. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Jeff May, and he's been a speaker actually at uh, our uh, Healthy Building Summit. Uh, a couple of times Jeff's been out there and he wrote a book and the book was called My House is Killing Me. And I'm going to attribute to Jeff uh, what I call a patch test. And a patch test involves really three things. It involves some aluminum foil, it involves a napkin, it involves some painter's tape. And that's really all there is to it. And we're going to put that foil, napkin, and tape onto, uh, you know, onto the surfaces that we're, we're trying to pull odors off of. We also need someone to sniff that once we've pulled it off, is familiar with it. And uh, we, by doing this, we have the ability to do a blind test so that, you know, the person smelling it doesn't necessarily know from where it's accessed. And we can do this by doing it outside in the clean environment. So these are some examples of, of patch tests. And I got this from uh, a source on the internet called Inspectopedia. You can see it done on a carpet. You can see it done on a wall. Um, and you can uh, see the inspector uh, sniffing it. Okay, I just smelled an unidentified foreign odor flying around my widow head. Okay, so, you know, here we have this canary, right? And in certain situations, we're going to need the assistance of a canary. And this is when we have a soul odor, when they're the only people that can smell it. And they're the only people that are going to help us find it. Okay, they're going to have to sniff the samples and they're going to have to tell us, do they detect it? or do they not detect it, okay? okay? So we need cooperation. If we don't have cooperation, um, we may not be able to locate the odor, okay? Um, when we put the aluminum foil on the surface and we cover the surface, uh, what happens is it allows odor to build up in that micro environment over a period of time. So typically, typically when we're doing a patch test, we're going to leave it up for a couple of days. All right. So that's kind of the existing method. So you're trying to absorb whatever that odor is and, and you're trying to narrow down where they're either it's originating from or where it has attached to materials is that like you're, you're you're trying to roll in or roll out uh different suspect materials okay. now there was another way to do it and this other way uh involves removing all the furniture furnishing from a room and covering the walls the ceiling and the floor individually with plastic. So the ceiling is isolated from the walls. Each wall is isolated from other walls and from the ceiling and floor. And then the floor is isolated. So at this particular point, what you would, what you, you used to do is you used to, you know, kind of cut an opening, put your nose in there after you've let a odor build, try to build up for a couple of days and see whether or not you can sniff it. But that's a much more laborious uh, and, and much more costly process in order to do. Sure. So what, what happened was I, I, I used to use these odor patch tests all the time. I had pretty good luck with it. And I ended up, uh, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. I ended up uh, being hired to go out and consult on an odor project uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. And what had happened in this particular situation was the client had a small water leak underneath her sink. Uh, it was a, a long uh it was a long, the leak went on for a long time. Uh, they didn't notice it right away, uh, probably several months before they actually noticed it. And they ended up having a little bit of mold growth, uh, you know, in the cabinet, a little bit of mold growth in, in the ceiling and in the wall uh, in, the, in the room uh, below. 
this woman and her husband were both uh, ex-military and the um, husband had another job because he did uh, technical work, you know, uh, computer stuff in the military. And he started a business when he got out and the mom was primarily just a grandma. So in any event, she calls uh, a neighbor who owns a restoration franchise and uh, the neighbor goes out. And as part of his remediation, he sprays a botanical antimicrobial uh, in the home and she objects to the smell of it. And she was so mad that he didn't ask her before he sprayed it, that he fires her. Or I'm sorry, she fires him. So then a couple of days later, um, the insurance company sends out another restoration contractor and she's also not happy with them. Uh, they end up having a third restoration contractor who gets a little bit further in the project. He ends up painting uh, the room below, you know, putting a, you know, doing mold remediation and putting a, uh, an antifungal coating on the affected surfaces. And she, uh, accuses him of urinating in the paint. She said that the room smelled like urine and you know, that the workers were trying to get back at her uh, by urinating in the paint. So well, they, pretty, what was the original odor? Was it described? I, I may have missed that. Okay. We're not there yet. We're, we're okay. still, we're, we're still working on it. Okay. So uh, there was no original odor. Uh, the uh, restoration companies, two of them sprayed botanical antimicrobials in there. She objected to the smells of the paint. Okay. Gotcha. Or I'm sorry, to the antimicrobials. Then gotcha. the room was painted. She objects to the smell of the paint. So at this point, she hires an indoor environmental professional to go out and inspect. The, 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 she's now more concerned about the paint room because it smells like urine to her. So he installs an ultraviolet light in this painted room to mm -hmm. remove the odor. Uh, he told her he didn't believe in ozone machines, and he, but he believed in ultraviolet light and its ability to solve the odor problem. Uh, it doesn't uh, solve the problem. Have you ever heard of that before? I heard of what? Someone using UV lights to solve an odor problem? Um, yes, um, because some UV lights create ozone and ozone, uh -huh. you know, can be utilized uh, to, to do it. Okay. But, but this particular device, you know, was, so, you know, was sold, you know, to eliminate odors and mold issues and, and, and so on and so forth. Hmm. So then she wants her air ducts cleaned and she demands that they be clean, cleaned quickly and uh, the, the contractor who's working on the home couldn't get them cleaned quick, quickly enough for her. So he tells her, if you want to have someone else uh, do the duct cleaning, uh, go ahead and hire them yourself. So she does that. She hires Sears Duct Cleaning in, in her area. They go out and they clean the HVAC system. And then they install ultraviolet lights within the air handling system. They explained to her that this is going to help solve odor problems and prevent allergies and so on and so forth. And, you know, they showed her a brochure. She thought that this was a really good thing. So she kind of goes along with it. And that's when all hell breaks loose uh, with odors in the house that creates all sorts of additional odors. And what the odors were caused by were reactions between the ultraviolet light and materials which were inside the HVAC system, such as plastics and wiring, and it created a new uh, created new odors. And you can see this uh, in the literature. Uh, in addition to that, I, I did some research and I found out that ultraviolet light could actually react with skin particles and create odors as well. So I had this data and decided that we were going to go up there and, and make this inspection. And then I read the reports. And in one of the reports, uh, it mentions that her, her issues may be also caused by electronic magnetic fields. And I don't know any 
much about that. And I don't know that you know much about that, but you and I have a buddy named Sal Duca who knows a lot about that. So I told the insurance company, uh, fine, if you want me to come out, I'd be glad to do that. But uh, I think we need Sal to be involved with this particular project as well. So uh, Sal went out and I also worked with uh, a local restoration contractor uh, in that area uh, named John Pletcher. So by this point, uh, there have been multiple indoor environmental professionals, but there's been tens of thousands of dollars in environmental testing, including this finding of EMFs. And now the, uh, the homeowners are demanding uh, more and more things be done in the house. So the next thing they do, they try to bake the house out. So they heat it up. Uh, they place these hydroxyl machines in there while they're heating it up. And this isn't fixing things. And at this point, the homeowner demands total contents replacement. And that's when I got the call and that's when I got involved. So I told the adjuster over the phone, I said, there are a couple of things we can do. You know, one is to have a restoration company go in, uh, remove furniture from, you know, the, the, the rooms where we have most of the complaints, install the plastic on the six surfaces. You know, we can do that and we can do some patch tests. And he said, look, I'm fed up with these people and uh, I don't want to invest a whole lot of more time or more money uh, in this, you know, we're ready to take a stand with them that we're not going to do anything else and we don't owe them any more money. Uh, we're willing to pay you and Sal and, and the local contractor to come out for a day, but we're not, you can't do anything that's going to take any longer than a day. So um, at that point, I decided, well, we would try to use this patch test, but then how could I make it better? How could I improve upon uh, the patch test. So, you know, Archimedes was famous for, you know, uh, the word Eureka, you know, which is, means I, I found it. And um, what I decided to do is how could I speed up this, this patch test? How could I accelerate it? And we know that by the addition of heat and moisture, that's generally uh, one thing that happens in houses that have had a fire. When it gets hot, you smell it. When, it. when it gets damp, you smell it. So I decided to add heat and moisture to the patch testing process. And that's what we did. So we used distilled water. Uh, we took a hair dryer, and we were able to set up the patches and then heat them. Uh, all was good. We were able to pull all sorts of odors off. The problem was the client refused to cooperate. Mm. Uh, she wouldn't come to the house while we were doing the testing, even though we drove all night, you know, in order to get there. Uh, she just was absolutely, totally uh, uncooperative. And she sent her husband uh, instead. So in order to do this accelerated pass, patch test, it was fast, it was quick, it could be done on site. It was a broad approach. And it's really not intended to speciate and determine what it is we're smelling. It is determined to determine whether something smells or whether it doesn't. So as long as odor is present on a surface, again, you know, there would be a solution. Uh, what we did with uh, when we were in between these patch tests that we did, we kind of cleanse our nose. And what, what I did is I used one of these K cups, you know, that had ground coffee in it. And that's kind of a good thing to kind of cleanse your nose in between samples, um, you know, when you're sniffing. So we were able to locate a couple of things, you know, when we were there, uh, we found that there was a, a natural gas leak actually that Sal found. He had a meter without a national gas leak um, you know, in the furnace area, and that could account for, you know, they add methane, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, they add um, an odorant to the natural gas uh, so that you would be able to smell it. And we thought maybe she was picking up, you know, uh, some of the odorant. Uh, we knew that uh, the UV could react with skin. We knew the UV could react with plastics and create some smoke odors and so on and so forth. So, you know, we were able to write our report. So I kind of got obsessed with it, you know, with this testing process and, and decided that, you know, how could I make it better? And then I started doing 
kind of experimentation and kind of taking this in a direction that I don't know that anyone uh, had, had gone before. Hey, Cliff, before we get too Go detailed ahead. here, let's let's break and thank our sponsors Sounds at halftime. And then I've got a question good. or two when we come back. All right, we'll okay, be right okay. back with the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick, for talking odor hunting. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant <clears throat> results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research, CIRI Science. Dot org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us. Particlesplus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations. TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals. Availability, reliability, and ease for all your IAQ and restoration needs at sunbeltrentals.com. April Air, Healthy Air, Healthy Home, April, A-I-R-E dot com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back with the Z-Man. Cliff, before we get into the uh, the new method you're working on here, um, I, I just want to get a little more on the, the story you just told there. Did the did the husband, you know, agree with the report? Did anybody, you know, give you feedback on the report? Did they say, okay, we think we found the odor now. Let's figure out how to clean it up. Okay. So uh, what happened is uh, Sal was, uh, Sal checked the house out and um, he actually found, an, uh, there was no serious EMF issue. He actually found some wiring that was done improperly, I guess, when the house was built uh, that he advised these people to correct. Actually, outside the house, he found some, um, you know, EMFs that, you know, were kind of in the neighborhood, but, but nothing, uh, you know, nothing significant. Um, the husband didn't, I mean, the husband, this was a situation where, um, you know, one person smelled it. And a cleaning lady uh, who had done some cleaning work for them also claims to have smelled this odor. And I believe that it was directly related uh, to the ultraviolet lights, uh, you know, being utilized, you know, within the HVAC system. I, I, and, you know, I found in the literature that it could create, it would degrade plastics, that it could create um, smoke odors that, uh, I found in the literature the fact that it could it, it could create that ultraviolet light in reaction with skin could produce odors, and hmm. you know we we found uh, that there was a natural gas leak. So we had a combination of different things, and because she wouldn't cooperate with us, we really couldn't go any further you know, in terms of uh, developing a remediation protocol, uh, et cetera. And I suspect that, you know, that, that this will go to litigation or it'll settle outside of litigation. I mean, the, the family was out of the house for a year, uh, you know, wow. when we got there. Over the, and, and their main concern was that urine odor from after they painted or was there some other it, it was all of these things, you know, there's the smell in the house and I can taste it. And it, again, it was just the wife. And, and she said that um, her attorney uh, refused to let her go into the house, uh, that her doctor wouldn't let her 
uh, you know, be the canary and sniff some samples and, 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 and so on and so forth to help us determine, you know, I mean, we could, I could pull odors off of different materials. The bottom line is I don't know whether or not that was what she was smelling or not. Right. If she would identify, yeah, this is what I smell, and fine, then this is this is an item. We'll keep looking for this, and you know we can kind of progress it and, and move it forward. But I mean, we were in and out of the house in four hours basically because she wouldn't cooperate with us. Now, one final question: If, if you had determined and she agreed, let's just kind of you know, play through this a little bit. She agreed with your determination that it was the ozone and reacting with skin cells or the HVAC system. And the methane, obviously, that could be fixed pretty easily. You just tighten that up or put a new, you know, put a new uh, joint in, in there. You know, you just replace whatever the problem area was. How would you have recommended they fix the odor problem that was related to the ozone and, and the HVAC system and or the skin? Okay, well, what had happened was uh, she complained about the lights, so the, the lights actually were the ultraviolet lights that went into the HVAC system. Uh, they were removed by the time that we got there. She had complained about that. I couldn't smell anything unusual in the house. Sal couldn't smell anything unusual in the house. John Pletcher couldn't smell anything uh, unusual in the house. You know, we had three different opinions. None of us could smell it. And, and again, um, it's real important that and I, I think, you know, when, when, when we, uh, I think, let me finish because I think I may anticipate and answer some of the questions, but I, right. I, I, want, I, I want you to see kind of how we got there. So I'm just so, one other thing you did mention yeah. that when you did the patch test, you did pick up some odor from that, correct? Okay. C correct. I was able to get odors off of upholstery. I was able to get odors off of a wall. Okay, none of which smelled unpleasant, but again, I, I don't know what she's smelling. Unless she can identify it, I can't pinpoint it. And I need her cooperation. And by the use of placebos in doing this, there'd be a certain amount of placebos introduced. You know, do, do you smell it here? Do you smell it on this one? Do you smell it on this sample? She's not going to know where the samples are coming from. She's just going to smell the samples. But this gotcha. would this would determine her ability to, you know, whether there's really an odor problem or she just thinks there's an odor problem. You know, I think gotcha. we would have some sort of definitive evidence in, in, okay. in regards to that. All right, let's okay. look at what you're working on now. Okay, so after I, I went back, I started playing around with different uh, types of sampling media. I think the sampling material or media needs to be individually packaged so that, you know, it's clean, it's sterile, you know, when you take it out there, it's not been utilized before. So I think that's an important component of it. So what you're actually looking at is a sandwich. Okay. And just imagine if this is a peanut butter sandwich and you're looking at the top of a piece of white bread. OK, so at the bottom, you'd also have a piece of white bread. And then in the middle, we would have peanut butter. So this essential this media is essentially three different pieces. There's an absorbent media on the top. There's a, an absorbent media on the bottom and in between, which would be the peanut butter. I have a moisture barrier that's in there. OK, OK. okay the purpose of this is that when I go to use it, I have the ability to either wet the surface, moisten the surface, or in this particular case, not moisten the surface, moisten the top piece of absorbent material so that the surface remains dry. And I wanna use this moisture to, as a source of humidity within this micro containment that I'm gonna put on top of it whoops there we go all right all right okay all right so what i can do with this is i can add moisture to it or i can add other types of chemicals to this that might dissolve an odor that is there for instance you could add alcohol you could add ether 
you could add other types of solvents depending on what type of odor that we were looking for. And we have the ability of adding it, either applying it directly to the surface or just applying it um, to the top of the, uh, the media in this particular situation. So the surface rema remains dry and we would just have vapor you know, within, within an enclosure. Okay, so what you're looking at at this particular point is how we can take a sample. So uh, we have this, this round base plate, which sets on top of the sample. You can see that. There's a clear media that is underneath that that creates essentially uh, the enclosure. Okay, so there's plastic that goes underneath. We can see what we're doing. Coming in from the right, you can actually see a thermometer. That's okay. a, a temperature sensor. Okay, and what the device does is it has a built-in heat source, and it also has a built-in uh, thermometer. So what happens is we create heat externally, and then we can measure the heat internally. You follow me? I know what the exact temperature is. Uh, can you see my, my arrow? Yes. Okay. So, you know, we're heating this entire area and I can measure the exact temperature of where the heat probe is. And typically that heat probe would be underneath uh, the media. And there's a groove cut into this base plate, which en enables this uh, thermometer to, or set heat sensor uh, to go through. Okay. All right. And when, what I wanted to do is make this repeatable. And so we have a constant distance. We always have the same distance. When we were doing the odor patch testing in the home, it took two people to do it. Because what we were trying to do is ensure that we heated these surfaces up to 145 degrees. It, it took both John and I, took two people to do it. Uh, using this device, it only takes one person to do it. And it can be done uh, in any direction. So you can uh, take a, one person can take uh, a sample off of a ceiling. I can put this on a ceiling. I can put this on a wall because essentially this is attached to that plate uh, that, that, that's on the bottom. And we can uh, confirm that we hit a minimum temperature. Uh, with this, we have an odor, I'm sorry, temperature reactive tape that's in there. And when you hit 145 degrees, uh, the tape essentially changes color. So we could go into a courtroom and show them that, yes, you know, each one of these tests hit 145 degrees. Uh, we can measure the temperature and relative humidity in there and we can use a reactive uh, paper that changes color based on temperature, or I'm sorry, based on relative humidity. <laughs> and these are some of the uses for it. So if we go to the right side, we have a uniform distance, we have a consistent uniform temperature, we can confirm that we hit the temperature, we can observe what we're doing through the window to be sure we're consistent or someone else can look through the window. We have the ability to do dry and wet sampling. We have the ability to do damp volatile sampling and we can sample on ductwork. So if we go to the left, we can use this to map an odor. We can use this as quality control, for instance, in fire restoration uh, or the contents clean uh, before they're going to be, you know, if, if there's a pack out before they're going to be reintroduced uh, back into the home, we can use it as a quality control tool. Uh, as I said, we can sample horizontally and vertical. Vertically, we can sample on hard surfaces, non-porous surfaces, um, and um, we have a soft material uh, which prevents damaging or scratching or anything like that, um, you know, during the process. And actually, we filed the patent on Wednesday. So, uh, you know, it's now patent pending. Uh, pretty fired up about it. But, uh, you know, if, if you have any other questions or if there's any other questions in chat, uh, you know, we can go through that. Um, just uh, people asking if they could contact you and talk to you a little more. I'm going to give them my email and then uh, sure. I'll send 
I'll send that to you. Um, I, I, I kind of lost track there from a, that machine that you had on there, Cliff. What was that thing? I had to send these slides in a uh, some time ago to get this presentation approved for Florida credits. Okay. okay, so there were certain things I couldn't show because I wasn't sure we'd have the patent application and, and so on and so forth. So essentially what you don't see in this picture is a heat source and a thermometer, you know, which sets inside. Okay, so this is the, the, end, of the, the end of the heat source. I see. Here. So that is the heat source there, basically. And what the, about the, this is the base? The heat source essentially fits down into the base from above. Okay. And then there are two, the, the, there's a thermometer, which indicates uh, the temperature at the end of the thermocouple. And then there's a thermometer the, that indicates the temperature uh, coming out of the heat source here. Gotcha. And that's programmable. So what happens is, you know, if you set this, it, for instance, if I want 145 degrees here, um, I, I need to set this heat source, I think, at around 300 degrees because there's an airspace of, uh, I think, four inches between the bottom of this and the uh, window. The sampling media there. Okay. I just, I wasn't sure. I hadn't, uh, I didn't see the heat source there. And that's just kind of the way of directing that heat toward that sampling Correct. media. Correct. Gotcha. Right. And, and okay. it, it actually takes um, 15 seconds to uh, to actually uh, do a sample, you know, once once it's warmed up and so on and so forth and we're set up, uh, we can, you know, get a reading within 15 seconds. And, and then do you, do you do different levels of heat or just the 145 you mentioned? No, no, we have the ability to do different levels of heat. Uh, we can go up to probably... On the outside, probably 700 degrees would, would probably be around the maximum that we could introduce, which, you know, with heat loss and everything might be a maximum at, at, at the thermocouple of 350, something like that now. I think oh, and then, so this is an, um, an improvement on the patch test. Is that accurate yeah. to say? Yeah. Okay. And what, what happens is there's no tape with this, Joe. So we don't have to, we don't have to tape it on, uh, with the patch test. Um, you couldn't really see exactly where the patch is, you know, with this, you can see it. And then we have all the parameters, which are repeatable, the distance, the temperature, the ability to record, uh, the, you know, the different types of solvents, uh, that can be utilized. And, and what we're doing is there's a piece of wood that's there. And what we did is I actually put uh, a smoky substance, oil of Cade. Uh, I took dilute solutions of that in alcohol and drew like little circles on here with different dilutions and so on and so forth to uh, see if we could, you know, pull them off with the patch test. So, you know, I'm writing a white paper as well. And um, you know, on it because I'm just well, kind of fascinated with it at this point. It's a fascinating topic, whole, the whole odor topic. Now, the question I have is, okay, so you're heating this up while it's on the, you know, wherever you're sampling, and then uh, are you sniffing it when you're done heating it up? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So you're right, pulling right. it out of the air, you're sniffing it, or you're having the customer uh, sniff it to help you better track down the location of the source of the odors correct like if, if i'm going if, if i'm going into a home and looking for a ufo okay i need their help if i've done fire restoration on their home i don't necessarily need their help i can do my own quality control and then we can kind of do quality control uh you know together with it and then you'd also don't need to send this sample out to a laboratory. It's something you can do yourself. You can do as many as you want. Um, take your time, you know, do 50, 60, a hundred of them. And you don't have the extra laboratory cost. It's just the cost of you doing the work. Um, and right. then, and, and the lab report again is going to 
give you information that I'm not sure is valuable. Sure. Sure. And, and, and maybe quite costly uh, per sample. And, you know, the question is, is by having the placebo effect and be able to introduce these, you can determine whether they really smell something or they don't, you know, if, if there's an odor complaint after restoration or mold remediate, you know, I still, it still smells moldy or, or this, smell, we can determine whether that substance does or doesn't by having them determine it. You know, here's, there's three of them, you know, which one doesn't smell moldy? or whatever oh, you know and you can have two in a placebo or whatever and it's not that you couldn't do that using the patch test it's just that this speeds up the process tremendously oh yeah no absolutely and we have the ability of doing things with this that i don't think uh you know could be done uh with the patch test very good uh john let's go to the roundup real quick The Roundup is brought to you by April Air, providing healthy humidity, ventilation, and air purity solutions for new and existing homes. April Air, healthy air, healthy home at aprilaire.com. If we're running low on time here, but I thought, you know, one final, uh, maybe a little anecdote or a story you could give on on a, a project where you were looking for an odor that maybe others had difficulty finding and what you did to find it? You know, I think typically it involves an investigation and generally there are going to be uh, some clues. You just need to, you need to find the clues. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, what I've done, a lot of times in fire situations, the hidden odors are inside of a wall cavity or they're inside of a ceiling cavity. And a lot of times, you know, what I'll do is I'll remove the electric uh, switch plates, you know, the outlet covers and switch plates and, 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 and places like that and see whether or not uh, I can see smoke residues or pull smoke residues, you know, from the insides of those cavities. And normally, uh, you know, that's, that's a good hint. A lot of times they're in the air handling system, uh, you know, that, uh, I, I typically would ask, you know, when do you smell it? Do you smell it all the time? Or, you know, what are the, you know, when do you smell it? What's going on? Do you, uh, and typically when you can reduce this down, you get some ideas of, you know, where we might look for it. Let me ask you one other thing, Cliff. As far as um, doing odor investigations, one of the big problems is the the fatigue your nose you know once you're once you're in a building you smell things when you first walk in but then you know you you, you lose that sense you can't smell it any longer i used to tell people well you got to go back outside you got to kind of clear things you used coffee and i'm, coffee I'm just beans. curious what coffee what beans. uh what led to that discovery i think people have done it for years i know some perfumers do it when they're developing that's um, it okay a, a product and so on and so forth so it's commonly done. I think it takes more time, uh, you know, if you're waiting or what, you know, or going outside, going coming outside, back, in. back in, you know, yeah. Cause what happens is then they have to take a smoke break and they have to go to the washroom <laughs> while it's close to lunch or whatever. And, you know, I think there's too much waste of time. Great, great tip. All right. This is radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to my co-host, the Z-man Cliff Slotnick and, of course, Pete Consigli down there at the AML Winter Break, a.k.a. the Florida Mold Conference. I also want to thank John. You got to have faith that the controls our growing group of loyal listeners and sponsors. Uh, we'll be back next week. We've got a panel of people coming in next week. We're going to focus on moisture and mold issues next week. So look forward to having you back next week for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening. Thank you, Bill. Okay.